I teach here at CMU, and usually when I have classes after 3 o'clock, I want to make sure that my students are still awake. If they're not, we do jumping jacks or Simon Says. Are you awake? Good. All right. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much, and good afternoon to everyone. Let's see. This will work. Tell me if you can't hear me, okay? All right. So my students and I here at CMU have been for a few years now interested in molecular identification of the coniatus weevil that we find here in um, western United States. So today I'm going to give you an update on our findings on that. And I'll also talk about some brand new, fresh out of the oven data on the diapause response of these weevils. So for all of us here who are interested in tamarisk and its impacts on tamarisk, and just as we heard in the last talks, um, the Dyravda beetles, the tamarisk leaf beetles, are no strangers to us. These beetles were very well studied before they were released here in the United States, both in their native range and then uh, here in the United States. We know quite a bit about their life cycle, about their physiology, about their host specificity. However, that is not true for this little weevil uh, of Coniatus genus. Um, they showed up in North America, and we really don't know where they came from, and we don't know much about it. So ever since they have shown up in western Colorado, uh, I've been very interested in finding out more about them, because I think they're super cute and beautiful, um, and I want to know more about them. So, um, these weevils have been actually found since 2006, first in Arizona, and since then they have been expanding their range to Southern California, Utah, Colorado, Nevada, Texas. So they have been in Western United States quite a bit. Their first uh, published report was in 2011, where it was identified as Coniatus splendigilis, the splendid tamarisk weevil. As a matter of fact, there are 24 different species of uh, Coniatus um, uh, beetles in their genus. And out of these 24, three of them, Suavis, Splendigilis, and Stephenae, are actually morphologically very similar. So the taxonomy becomes a little bit vague there. Um, they're all believed to be natural herbivores of Tamarix. They're all small. And Splendigilis is also small. It's about three millimeters in length. Uh, due to its size, shape, and color, it blends really well with the plant. So if you've ever been in a tamarisk area and look for Diarabda beetles, um, they're really easy to spot. Okay, They're big. They do stand out. But you can't say the same thing for the Coniatus weevils. They're very small. Their color matches almost perfectly with the tamarisk. Uh, they don't move around really fast. They're kind of slow movers. Um, they don't fly around that much. Um, so they're hard to find. And they are sometimes mixed up with the little uh, green leaf hoppers that we have on tamarisk too. But when you look under the microscope, they're quite different. So um, there were actually three species, not splendigilous, but Rupundus, tamarisi, and Cenini that have been studied and evaluated as possible biocontrol agents for tamarisk. And out of these, tamarisk was approved by the Technical Advisory Group for Biological Control Agents of Weeds, but as we know, there have been no known intentional, re intentional releases of any coniatus species in U.S. So the question is, where do they come from? Who are they? What do they do? Um, when you look at their native ranges of these three species, Splendigilis, Tamarisi, and Suavis, you will notice that there's a lot of overlap. So Splendigilis covers an area from Eastern Europe, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran, all the way to Afghanistan and Turkmenistan. When you look at Tamarisi, it goes as west as Portugal and Morocco, and all the way to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan on the east. Okay? basically covers most of the Mediterranean region. Uh, Suavis, on the other hand, is found in western 
Mediterranean, as well as in Turkey and Iran and Iraq, and again, all the way to Turkmenistan and Afghanistan. So there is a lot of overlap, okay? And they do cover pretty big ranges. As a matter of fact, if you look at the native range of Steve and I, you will see that we see them all the way from Eastern Europe to all the way Central Asia, to Mongolia, okay? So they're all over the place. So what am I interested in? I want to find out where our beetles came from. Where did our corneas come from? And we try to answer that question by looking at their DNA. Another question that I've been looking at is whether or not we've had a single introduction of these beetles in the United States or several introductions. And thirdly, we have been interested in their life cycle. Okay, again, we don't know much about their phenology. So for the first two goals, um, we have been collecting or our collaborators and other scientists who have been kind enough to collect um, specimens for us from all over United Western United States. Um, we had samples from Las Vegas, Arizona, several spots in New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado. The overseas specimens were mostly collected by Dr. Cristofaro and his colleagues. Um, we have several samples um, as west as Italy and Sicily, going all the way to east to, um, uh, this is Uzbekistan, Karshi, Uzbekistan. Uh, we also have samples from Bulgaria, three different spots in Turkey, Dead Sea in Jordan, and very northern Iran, very close to Armenia and Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan. You can see that where these samples have been collected overlap very well, at least most of them, with Splendidulous native range and also with the others. So what we do is we get these specimens, we crush them, we isolate their DNA, we amplify a mitochondrial gene, cytochrome oxidase 1, which is used for barcoding. Uh, when we get the amplification, we send that se sequence to be, this DNA to be sequenced, and then the sequences are manually aligned, uh, followed by maximum parsimony analysis on PAL. So in the next few slides, I'm going to walk you through this 50% uh, majority rule consensus tree. Um, out of 796 total characters, 179 of them were parsimony informative. Okay, And even though we normally do a 1.3 kb fragment for CRO1, because some of our specimens would not amplify using the parameters that we use, we actually had to do with about 800 base pair fragments. So the very first take home lesson that we take from this tree is that all of the US specimens group together very closely and they group apart from any of the overseas specimens that we have. Okay. As a matter of fact, when you look at the nucleotide sequence of these specimens, we see none to very little nucleotide variance, okay? That definitely suggests a single introduction because we don't see a genetic variation that you would expect to see. This is also true for some of the color morphologies, polymorphisms that we see among our specimens. The second take-home exam, not exam, lesson, <laughs> uh, Second take home lesson is the fact that our specimens group apart from the other overseas specimens. We have not found a match yet for where our samples have come from. Okay? So as you can see, the samples collected in Jordan group together. Those collected in Uzbekistan, in Iran group together. Uh, one sample in Italy and one sample in Bulgaria are kind of on their own and the Turkish samples group together. If I have to say anything, I would say maybe the US specimens look the most like the Turkish specimens, but they're still significantly different to say that they are the same population. All right, so based on our current data, 
we are still going with the hypothesis that there has been a single introduction made and not uh, several. Uh, we do see several color and pupil case morphologies uh, like these, so green, brown, red, uh, different pupil case morphologies, dense or more loosely woven, and we believe these might be due to phenotypic plasticity. Okay? It is possible that even though their mitochondrial DNA doesn't show much variation, there might be some nuclear gene variations, and for that we are actually accumulating some more uh, nuclear DNA sequences to differentiate between these populations. So in the second half of my talk, I want to shift gears and talk about the life cycle and the diapause response of this weevil. Um, this is not a new slide. You've seen this two years ago if you were here. Um, Austin Hadley, one of my research students, and I spent a couple of months at the insectary to observe the development of the weevils from egg through larval stages, through pupation, and adults. And we found that it takes about 35 days to go from egg all the way to adult. We know that there are at least four different larval instars. The last instar spins a pupil case where it will undergo metamorphosis before it emerges as an adult. So Austin really enjoyed this project. And um, oh, sorry went overhead myself. So during our studies, we actually made some observations of where the females prefer to oviposit. And we found that they actually like to put their eggs within the flower buds. Here you can see the larvae that have just come out, and they start lay eating the flowers. So that uh, immediately brought up the question whether or not um, this would stunt the seed production for the tamarisk. When we looked at the um, preference for oviposition, we found that most of the eggs were found at the very tip of the branches. That's where most of the growth happens for the plants. So if you eat away at the very tip, you will not um, grow. Um, the second biggest group is found inside of the side leaves. Again, the um, larvae will start eating the leaves. And only in emergency cases, they will start laying eggs on bare branches. We don't actually see that in the field. It's only in the lab if they don't have any more spots at the tips of the side leaves where they don't have room to lay eggs. Um, this bar over here, which is the flower bud, is a little bit misleading. It looks like there aren't that many. But remember, most of the foliage that we used to feed these guys did not contain flowers. So we do definitely need to further this investigation to see if they do prefer to lay in the flowers or not, that would be a really good information to know. OK. So I guess Austin enjoyed working on the Coneatus that much. So this year, when he was working at the Palisade Insect Tree, he decided to do more experiments with the Coneatus. And what he did was he went out and collected 800 weevils from the field in October. So remember, by October, you don't actually see a lot of diarabda out in the field because they have all gone into diapods. But coniatus can still be found on foliage. So he collected these 800 weevils and brought them into the lab and put them in an incubator that had a pretty short day length. So the weevils were put in a 12-hour light, 12-hour dark photo period, where the temperatures were 25 degrees Celsius during the day and 15 degrees Celsius during the night. If you were to put diarabia beetles into incubator in these conditions, all of them would go into diapods. The interesting thing was the weevils stayed active. Okay, So the challenge now was to get them to become inactive, to basically finish off the last step of diapod induction. Okay, Because when we think about diapods, there are several events that need to happen. At least with Thyrevda, we know that they cease to mate, they cease to lay eggs, they feed extensively and fat, fatten up to so basically overwinter, and then they stop doing everything and go into the leaf litter and wait for the winter to come. Okay? So, what he did was he took these 800 weevils and divided them into four 200 weevil containers. One of them was 
um, maintained in a container very similar to this one. The next one had the same photo period, but had cooler temperatures, 20 to 5 degrees Celsius. The third one, again, had the same photo period, but was colder, 10 degrees Celsius during the day and 5 degrees Celsius at night. And then the last container had the same temperature, but had much shorter day lengths, 9 hours at light and 15 hours at dark. And this is what he observed. He saw that as long as the temperatures were warm, the weevils preferred to stay active. So he scored for the presence of weevils on the branches versus on the in the leaf litter. And as long as the temperatures were 25 to 15, 60 to 70 percent of the weevils preferred to spend time on the foliage rather than in the leaf litter. However, as soon as the temperature was lowered to 20 and then to 10, you can see that there is a drastic uh, decrease of weevils that are on the foliage. So these results basically suggest that with coniatus, it's the temperature, but not for the period, that induces them to enter diapause. Or I should rephrase that. They are probably ready to go into diapause, but to basically completely go into diapause. Okay. Another way of looking at this data is by following these populations through about three month period. Okay. So we have these four different populations and all of them started out in warm, short conditions. And then at different time points for each population, they were switched to another condition. So in population one, they were switched to a warm but very short day length. Condition. And as you can see, the activity of the weevils did not change. In population two, they were switched to a cool, short condition. And you can see a gradual decrease of beetle activity. In population three, they were switched to a cold, short condition. And you can see a drastic decrease into almost 2% activity. Okay. And likewise, in population four, just like in population two, you can see this gradual decrease of activity. Again, they were switched to cold short here and here and here. And as you can see, in all cases, most of the weevils were now inactive. They went into leaf litter. In population three, though, they switched them back to warm and long conditions and their activity rebounds as it happened in the other populations. In two of these containers, in population one and four, the weevils were treated different than two and three. Before they were allowed to warm up, they were frozen for seven days at minus five degrees Celsius. This did not affect their survival rate. However, it dramatically decreased the amount of time needed for them to start lay eggs. So those weevils that were frozen, it took them only nine days to start laying eggs, whereas the others took 19 to 21 days. So it's almost like freezing is a reset button to terminate diapause and start becoming reproductive again. Um, so in summary, our DNA results suggest a single introduction. We still do not have a matching source for our North American Coniatus, but I can say that uh, they were probably not from Italy, Turkey, Bulgaria, Jordan, Iran, or Uzbekistan. We're continuing to look. Um, our observations have shown that our adults can stay active for over a year. They don't die. As long as you keep them happy, you give them food, they will live for a year, which is very different than what we see with the diarabda beetles, because they will send us and they will die within a month and a half. Um, we have shown that there is some oviposition uh, preference, which might suggest their effects on plant growth uh, and decreased seed production. And um, Austin's data and our um, observations in the field um, basically saying that the diapause in coniatus is regulated by temperature rather than for a period 
may suggest or may uh, provide an explanation of why we see these weevils out earlier in the spring than Diarabda and later in the fall, still active, still defoliating the uh, plants. Okay, so we believe that there might there might be some synergistic um, relationship between Diarabda and Coniatus to defoliate tamarisk. Okay. Oops, what happened? Okay, um, so in the future, we're continuing to compare DNA sequences collected um, from collected specimens, collected specimens, and another thing that we are looking into is obtain some museum samples that have already been taxonomically identified and compare them to our uh, samples. Um, so most of this work do was done here at CMU, at the Biological Sciences Department, and also at the insect tree uh, in Palisade. Um, they have provided not only the incubators, but also the know-how and the help that we needed at times. Um, the research was funded by the Faculty Professional Fund Development Fund here at CMU. And I must uh, thank a lot our Cuniatis collectors, Massimo Cristofaro and his uh, colleague, uh, Tom Dudley and Rowan. Um, without all of their help, I would not have been able to do this um, study. And then last but not least, these are the CMU undergraduates who have worked on this project, little or a lot. Uh, this is Austin Hadley, who has done the life study and the diapause response. And all the other students have been uh, working on or have worked on the molecular data stuff. And I just want to point out over here, this is Amanda Stalky, and she's here in the audience, and she'll be giving a talk tomorrow. Um, she's a graduate student at University of Idaho, and she'll be talking about IRAPDA genetics. So if you have time, I strongly suggest you go and uh, listen to her talk. All right, I'm going to stop right here and take any questions if you have any. I have it. I have it. I need a student who is interested in doing that kind of stuff. And unfortunately, Austin just graduated. Thank you. Oh, sure. So uh, James Tracy was asking if we, I have tried to uh, cross the color morphs to look at the um, inheritance of the color uh, phenotypes. Yeah. Amanda? Our DNA, ribosomal DNA. And it has worked. We actually had to go through a lot of primer pairs, but we have found some that work. We just now have to accumulate the data. It takes time to do that. So it's actually, we have been having this problem. If you notice, I haven't put, Sicily was not on that tree because it won't amplify. Italy amplifies very poorly. Iranian and Uzbek uh, uh, beetles, they did amplify with an internal primer and a reverse primer. But our forward primer that we use over here probably does not have enough homology to get an amplification. So we're working on finding other primers that will hopefully work. I, I haven't given up, but I also didn't want to exclude them. So I shortened that. But I just want to say that when I use the full 1.3 kb, the remaining of the tree stays the same. It doesn't change drastically. No, that's actually what Austin wanted to do. But as science happens, he stumbled on this stuff. Yeah. So the question is, does it feed on the tips of the tamarisk leaves? And yes. Um, I don't have the slides here, but what they do is the, the mother uh, eats off the tip of the bud, and it will lay an egg at the tip. So it's kind of like a nest. And then the larva will come out and will start eating the leaves, and it will slowly and spiral fashion go down, eating all the leaves and defoliating that branch. And we have observed, I mean, I have watched that under the microscope. It's amazing what they do. And that's actually one of the things that makes rearing this uh, insect in the lab so hard, because they have to be inside of that um, plant. And they're so fragile and so small. If you don't have a live plant, but just a small piece of branch that you're trying to keep alive for a few days, it dies off. And it's very hard to transfer the larva from that branch to another one. Yeah, so if we're talking about the weevil, basically 
it will eat away and it will molt to the next instar. And it's the larger they get, the more rugged that they get. They, they're better at maneuvering the branches and going from one branch to the other. But when they're in first and second instar stages, they're very, very fragile. All right. Thank you.